Hi, Alex. You can hear me, right? You guys hear me? Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Wendy, can you hear me? Excellent. Perfect. Okay. So um, we'll start. 
and I'll just introduce everyone. And uh, the floor goes to each of them, the U.S. and then Canada. All right. Okay. <laughs> Some <laughs> 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 Uh, hi everyone, I know it's late in the afternoon, all of you want to sleep, and then we're really honored to have um, the U.S. and from, you, uh, and, and from Canada, they're up since 7 a.m. this morning, so still a long day for <laughs> Okay, let me, uh, thank, welcome to our class. This, uh, this lecture is part of the AMST 1099 course, uh, which is with the principal East and Permanent Science and Research, and is also cross-listed with the uh, core curriculum courses, pathway two, pathway two. Pathway two. So uh, this is pretty much our lecture for us. So it's really interesting lecture today. And the title is Body Autonomy, Culture, and Empowering Women in Egypt, uh, US and Canada, the differences that unite us. We're really honored to have three speakers today. We have from Egypt, the mother being team. We have Medak, one person. <laughs> Shed is unfortunately uh, yeah. sick today. She couldn't be uh, with us today. So we have Medak today. Let me just talk about, about, about Medak. Graduated with a bachelor's degree in political science from AUC, class of 2020. She's currently a certified sec a sexual health educator on the mother being's learning team, as well as a somatic experience, uh, experiencing practitioner and training. Her mission is to join women in healing their relationship with their bodies and discovering the endless wisdom, pleasure, and power they possess within themselves. Hi, everyone. And from the U.S., we have from Women's Advocates NGO, who are representing the U.S. in today's discussion, is Ms. Alexandria McDougall. Alexandra uh, McDougall currently lives in St. Paul, Minnesota, USA. It comes from uh, which translates into White Earth, which is a reservation in northern Minnesota. Alex has background working with uh, youth experiencing homelessness, child protection, involvement, chemical dependency, suicidal uh, ideations, human trafficking for nearly 10 years within the indigenous community in Minnesota. Alexandria, Alexandra uh, attended the University of Minnesota Morris, where she received her BA in psychology with an emphasis on culture. She also received her BA in anthropology with an emphasis on culture as well. Alex strives to walk alongside youth and victim survivors of violence and the goal of supporting their dreams, goals, and healing. However, that looks for them. Uh, Alex to enjoy spending time with her jobs, uh, working on lead work, listening to music, and spending time with her family. That is uh, Alexandria McDougall from Women's Advocates in the U.S. and from Canada. Second time, actually, to course, I'm really happy to have Wendy uh, from the London Muse Women's Centre uh, in London, Ontario. Representing Canada in this discussion is Ms. Wendy Goldsmith. Wendy Goldsmith is an advocate and, or counselor with the London Women's Center in London, Canada. She is also the coordinator of anti trafficking initiatives. Wendy has practiced in the field of social work for 35 years and is currently a trainer for the Ontario Ministry of Children and Community and Social Services Provincial Anti-Human Trafficking Coordinating Office in Canada. She trains frontline staff, law enforcement, and judiciary on how to work with sexually exploited youth. And is, it is uh, from the center uh, where Wendy works at, where I've shared a lot of uh, the documents on gender-based violence and the role of NGOs in this classroom. We took it before and I shared all that work. Welcome all three lovely ladies. It's been wonderful to have you today. Um, let me, I won't take any more of your time. The whole thing is an hour and 15 minutes. So let's start with Malek, and then Alice can take four, and then Wendy. Uh, please, if you have questions, keep them until the end. Write them down on a pa on paper, on your phones, it doesn't matter. But just let's keep the questions until the end. All right. Okay, so go ahead. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Malek. I am a sexual health educator, mother being. And today, I would like to have a conversation with you about how to navigate creating sex ed content for Arab women in the Arab world. Um, 
I would really like for this to be more conversational than it is like a lecture presentation. So I know you have to keep it at the end, but if anyone has any thoughts, ideas, or questions throughout the presentation, please let me know. Um, and I have one tiny kind of favorite to ask. I was asked to film certain parts of this, but my partner should not be here, unfortunately. So if someone can volunteer to help film some bits of the presentation, that would be amazing. Uh, uh, my yeah. students are here covering. Amazing, sure. Okay, so before I begin, I would like to start off by asking you guys, what was your experience with receiving sex ed growing up? Where did you get it from and how was it? Biology class. Biology class. What was it like? Uh, it was very awkward. I mean, everyone just kept laughing. And <laughs> We didn't learn much, so. Yeah. Do you remember, like, the overall theme of the Cosmic Environment? Just uh, sexual reproduction. Reproduction. Yes. Yep. Uh, well, me books, but I never opened them. So, yeah, they're awkward. <laughs> so, it's awkward, it's embarrassing. Yeah. 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 Uh, in our religious class, there was, like, a little no theme about. Raise your voices so everyone oh. else can hear online. Uh, there was like this theme about sex in general. Yeah. And they separated the girls from boys and okay. stayed it separately. So they did like gender stuff. Yeah, but the voice was more than this one. Anyone else? So let's begin with who is Mother Being. Mother Being is a tech company that specializes in creating and sharing sexual health knowledge to Arab women. So we do that through three offerings. We create educational content through programs, workshops, and offline events, and our social media, of course. Uh, we have a holistic women's health clinic that just launched last year, so we're very excited about that. And we also create body-safe models. So we approach women's health in a very multifaceted, holistic way, which is, myself, it's very unheard of in this region. So, Everything we offer our community, everything we offer our audience starts and ends with education. We believe that empowerment comes from body literacy, from your knowledge about your own body. So every single offering we have begins and ends with empowering and, and equipping the client with knowledge about their own body. So up until very, very recently, it was unfathomable to me to hear an Egyptian woman go online and speak about women's sexual health in Arabic. Uh, Mother Being started three years ago, and up until then, there was a very, very, very large gap in Arab women's access to culture-sensitive sexual health education. And it's very hard to get stats about sexual health in Egypt, but to give you an idea of how, uh, how, how, how much we need this education, 86% of Egyptian women aged 15 to 49 have been circumcised or have undergone FGM. Um, seven out of 10 girls aged 15 to 19 have undergone FGM. Vaginismus, which is a condition where the vagina clenches itself during sex, makes it very painful or impossible, yeah. is extremely prevalent in Egypt. In Benny Swift alone, it's estimated through a recent study that 70% of women suffer from painful sex. Um, and sexual dysfunction is extremely common on Arab and Christian women. So there is a very, very dire need for more culture relevant sex ed in this country. And on a global level, not just in Egypt, sex and sexuality are very loaded topics. It's not just about conveying information. It's never just about physically active sex. There's a lot of meaning and attitudes and beliefs and schemas attached to the information we give. So on a global level, sex ed confronts things like fear and trauma and shame and misogyny and patriarchy and disgust and guilt and gender-based violence. All of these things are elements that effective sex ed has to incorporate, not try to bypass or ignore. So when it comes to the topics we discuss, Given all of these elements we confront, people rarely use logic and reason when they're exposed to what we have to offer. I'll explain that, what that means exactly. So 
very briefly, I want to use something called moral foundation theory to explain what I mean by people not using reason and logic when talking about this extent. So moral foundation theory is a theory that tries to explain why moral judgments and cultural norms differ across the world, but at their core, they have very similar characteristics. So it suggests that innately all human beings are equipped with something called intuitive ethics or instinctive ethics that govern how we judge behavior or acts or something we're exposed to. And they elicit this automatic reaction of either acceptance or rejection to something. So these intuitive ethics or these instincts are divided into five things. Care, harm, fairness, cheating, loyalty, betrayal, authority, subversion, purity, and degradation. Care is the instinct to protect others and protect our offspring. Fairness is the instinct to, to punish cheating or injustice. Uh, loyalty is the instinct to uphold the, 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 the group unit or the group kinship. Uh, authority is the instinct to create positive social hierarchies. And purity is the instinct to protect yourself from the emotion of disgust. It is the instinct to protect your body from becoming desecrated or harm to contamination or bacteria or, or disease. Now, while these are instinctive, what counts for what is categorized within each of these themes depends on the conditioning and the socialization you receive growing up. So what society has taught you as something that counts as going against purity or authority or fairness or loyalty or care or harm is something that, that is learned. And through this conditioning, it elicits the exact same reaction that you get from these things. I'll explain Akhtar in a bit as well. So let's use this story as an illustration of what I mean by automatic reaction. Uh, would someone like to read? Anyone? Any volunteers? Anyone read? Read? Sure, go ahead. Julie and Mark are brother and sister. They are traveling together in France on summer vacation to college. One night, they are staying alone in a cabin near the beach. They decide that it would be interesting and fun if they try and make love. At the very least, it would be a new experience for each of them. Julie was already taking birth control pills, but Mark uses a condom too, just to be safe. They both enjoy making love, but they decide not to do it again. They keep that night as a special secret, which makes them feel even closer to each other. What do you think about that? Was it okay for them to make love? Thoughts, reactions. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Did anyone feel an immediate revulsion or repulsion by the story? Yes. Yeah? That's the moral foundation of purity at work. Even though, objectively speaking, there is nothing reasonably wrong about what they did, but it elicits an automatic reaction within you because you're conditioned to believe that incest is wrong, that this is impure, this is disgusting, this is foul, etc. Do you get what I mean? So unfortunately, when people are exposed to our content, they get the exact same reaction. Even though it's not reasonably unethical or reasonably immoral, because they are conditioned to believe that sexual topics or female sexuality or female body is, goes against the societal standards or norms of purity and care and harm and authority, they still get that exact, that, that, that exact same visceral reaction. So because of what we do, because of the content we present, we touch upon these two moral foundations. Am I making sense? So this is something we have to take into account when we create content for the Arabic. And more relativity from culture to culture depends on, the, on how you prioritize these foundations. Even your political spectrum position, your, uh, your judgment on elements, on people, on behavior, it all boils down to how you prioritize and the value you attribute to each of these elements. So this brings me to the point of bodily autonomy. Now, depending on who you ask or where you ask, bodily autonomy means different things to different people. To us, however, bodily autonomy means Possessing the knowledge, tools, and ability to make informed decisions when it comes to one's body and sexual health. Now, I can debate what the word ability means all day, but uh, <laughs> overall, <laughs> um, overall, what's important here is that a woman's bodily autonomy 
for us has to align with her own personal values, her beliefs, and her plans for herself without me imposing a particular worldview or ideology onto her. So I'm equipping her with knowledge she needs to look at her body through an objective, scientific, factual lens, and what she does with that information is up to her. Any questions? Um, I emphasize this because there's a very particular image that comes to mind when we think about what it means to be an empowered versus disempowered woman, especially in the Western psyche. So many of us have even internalized this, this image or narrative in our heads. It takes a lot of effort for us to unlearn and decolonize our minds in that regard. Uh, and it takes a lot of work to redefine how you perceive your own body. So our work involves creating online and offline spaces where women feel seen, comfortable, connected, and curious. I want to foster a sense of curiosity and safety towards her body, towards learning about her body. I'm not trying to foster resistance or rebellion. I know it's very easy for us to get work up and want to like scream from the top of our lungs and revolt against the patriarchy and pull it but what matters here is eroding that sense of shame by replacing it with curiosity, not with ideology or, or a plan or, or, or a, a dramatic point of view. So our approach to sex ed follows a comprehensive and holistic methodology. That means it's important for us to look at sexuality and, and sex and the body beyond the physical act of sex. Sexuality means so much more than just the physical act of sex. Sexuality encompasses, is the combination of all that you are. Everything you've experienced, everything that you've ever been through, all that you are manifests in some way through your sexuality, regardless of your sexual activity. So I have to look at it from a much broader lens in order to approach it in a more holistic way than just the physical act of sex. Does that make sense to everyone? And that is because sex and sexuality never happen in the back. Um, the physical act of sex, even if it's purely material, it does not happen in the back. There are power dynamics involved, there are uh, societal conditioning involved. You have to take these into consideration when you are talking to women about sex and sexuality. While conventional sex ed, like you said, involves things like birth control, contraception, SCI protection, reduction, it's usually very conception and abstinence based, which is very limited. Comprehensive sex ed focuses on de shaming and normalizing conversation around sexuality. And that means including things like consent and balance, pleasure, body image, and body literacy and acknowledging the inherent power dynamics involved in sex and sexuality. Without all of these things, I am speaking in a vacuum. I am not acknowledging the broader systems in which these, these women exist. With that being said, I have to do all of this in a way that is culturally and contextually relevant to the woman I'm speaking to. I have to learn how to speak her language. And speaking of language, I would like you guys to compare what comes to mind if you think of the word honor in English versus the word sharaf in Arabic. Oh, what do you think? I think the sharaf is a negative word. Mm -hmm. It's used in other connotations, yeah. <laughs> Any other answers? Zina? I feel like honor in English, uh, it's mainly in the context of the law, but it was a favorite. Mm. So honor in English is integrity. The integrity of like being an honor of a priest. Okay. It's not the shot of in Arabic. Shot of in Arabic, yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't mean it doesn't talk about someone's person. It's yeah. how people look at it. More morals, maybe. Okay. So when I deliberately use a language to convey sexual health information, I have to take into consideration that it tells me a lot about the cultural attitudes and the schemas and the connotations that are associated with that. I could say the exact same thing explicitly in two different languages, and they mean the same thing, but the implicit, the underlying meaning behind it is completely different. There is a reason why 
most of us can name our body parts and sexual anatomy English, but not in Arabic. There's a reason why we are more comfortable discussing these things in English, but we cringe or like have the sense of shame or disgust or we wince at these conversations and tones and acknowledge in Arabic. It's a very, very valid and intentional experience when we're unable to express ourselves sexually in our own language. When you say the same words in Arabic, you get this instant feeling of disgust and shame and judgment. Versus when you speak about them in English, you feel like it's more acceptable, it's cleaner, it has more variety, it's, uh, it's sexier even. The detachment and dissociation we feel towards our own language is part of a much greater colonial legacy that we've internalized growing up. As women, we grew up believing that sex and sexuality in our own body have no place in our country. That in order for me to be able to express myself sexually, it's sort of like I have to cognitively teleport myself outside my own identity in order to explore this part of me. So there's this split that happens within me. I either have to, ab have to abandon my identity as an Arab woman or I have to abandon my being, my, my a, a fundamental part of myself, and a sexual being. It's like these two experiences are mutually exclusive. So there's a quote that I love to use. Uh, Maria Aziz was an incredible sex therapist. Uh, she says that, <laughs> yeah, which means that which you cannot name, it's as though it doesn't exist. So the reason why most women are so dissociated and disconnected from their bodies it starts with them being unable to even name their own body parts. It's like there's a hole in this part of my body that I cannot even acknowledge. So when I insist on using Arabic to provide sex ed, it combats that gap that I feel between my identity and my sexuality. It announces it and it conveys the message that there is space for both. I can create space for both. I can bridge the gap between who I am as an Arab Egyptian woman and who I am as a sexual being. It is possible to imagine space for both experiences. And I, I know that there are forces we feel like in our culture that supersede our agency, that stand in the way of who we want to be as sexual beings. And that's why we have collective struggles. But in order for me to be able to effectively tackle these forces, to be able to effectively tackle these factors, I have to be able to create space in my language, in my culture, and imagine the possibility of me bridging that gap between these two experiences. And I have to rethink the way I define sexual empowerment on my own terms. We tend to use Western models as, as reference points. And that's very valid because we, we don't know anything else but that. But maybe we need to, to decolonize our mind in that regard in order to be able to forge a path that makes sense for us to reach our own embodiment of empowerment and liberty and freedom and sexual freedom. Okay, guys, we move so far? Okay. However, just speaking in Arabic, <laughs> doesn't mean that I'm speaking my audience's language. There is a lot more to it than that than just using Arabic. So our approach to education combines three elements. I have to de-shame the conversation and the themes around sexuality. I have to normalize experiences and I have to denormalize what isn't normal. What I mean by that is we have this uh, belief that what is common is normal. That's a fallacy. The fact that most women experience very painful sex in this country is seen as normal because it's so common. I have to denormalize that experience. And all of this has to be done within context. <clears throat> and that means I have to give it information in a way that feels digestible, relatable, absorbable, and relevant to her context. Otherwise, she will not be able to actually digest and apply this information in her own life. So, how do we do that exactly? 
As an educator, I have to ask myself three things. Who am I speaking to? How do I teach them? And what is the context that I operate in? So when I speak to an audience or to a woman, sometimes we tend to forget that a woman is not just an individual unique person, that I am speaking to an individual, a person who exists in a series of systems. I cannot speak to the micro without looking at the macro. The systems we exist in, the, 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 the systems that affect how we absorb and how we learn about ourselves and the world around us, greatly affect how we absorb new information. So, for example, when we create new content, we always try to speak to the persona we're speaking to. And we quickly realize that we're not speaking to just one woman. We're speaking to multiple women who cut through class and nationality and ethnic background. We're speaking to multiple backgrounds. And that's because we all intersect within the systems we exist in. We have collective shared struggles because we all share the same systems, regardless of class, regardless of nationality. So when I'm speaking to an audience, I have to take into consideration what is the context, the overarching order under which she exists in. So this is a small illustration of uh, Brompton Brothers ecological systems theory, which suggests that we exist in a series of symptoms, uh, sorry, of systems that interact and, and and affect how we view the world. So I have to understand this first before designing any content. Otherwise, we'll be very tone deaf, inapplicable, unrelated. So because we exist in all, this, in all, these, systems, all these systems together, these are some of the complaints we hear from our clients across the board, regardless of background. So things about fear and pain and disgust and thinking there's something wrong with me. We're all in the same sinking ship. And that is both a challenge and a relief because you can directly relate to the person you're speaking to. Any questions so far? Yeah, of course. So for Alex and Wendy, the sense is that uh, mother being, they, they get on their platform. Uh, I'm terrified of the pain. I'm just doing the Arabic parts. Uh, we're all in the same sinking boat. No, of course I cannot ask, how do I know do I have a hymen? These are all the questions that they actually get on the front floor. So you have to look at the ecosystem in which one person exists. Because if I'm just one person, it's a much more overarching baggage that, that she carries with her every single time she seeks this knowledge. So, I can talk about this all day, but on a global level, sexual shame and the suppression of human sexuality are hallmarks of the patriarchal order. And it's very easy for us to pathologize one area over the other and claim that, you know, the Middle East is a sexually disempowered area of the world versus the West. But if we are all under the same overarching system that manifests in different ways. So how is sexual shame connected to patriarchy? Shame is inherently a form of self-rejection. I reject a part of myself because I'm disgusted by it or I hate it. So when a woman feels a sense of sexual shame, she is rejecting a fundamental part of her being. She's rejecting her body. And when I reject this fundamental part of who I am, I disown it. And I feel like there are other forces outside of me my family, the streets, the state, my potential or current husband, who have more authority over my own body. And the person who has the least authority over their own body is actually the one that it belongs to. So I have less power in dictating what happens to my body, how I want to express it, how I want to use it, than these actors or factors or force outside, outside of the path. On the other hand, under patriarchy, men feel like they have to assert their power by asserting their dominance over the female body. So it's this vicious cycle that keeps feeding itself over and over and over again. And this detachment that women feel from their body is a form of very, very deep trauma. And it's a trauma that we carry intergenerationally, something we pass down to our daughters and their daughters and their daughters. <laughs> and that is how you maintain the system. 
by making it feel like it's the norm. That it's the reality of how things are, are governed and we stay in the way. So very early on, we learned the message that, okay, so I have this body, I'm not safe in it. People outside of me control it, use it, and want it. It causes me so much pain, so much danger, so much harm. I don't feel safe in this body. And so I give up my ownership and authority over my own body. So when I teach women how to reconnect back to their body, how to embrace their sexuality and their pleasure, how to foster a sense of curiosity rather than shame towards their own body, that is how I break the cycle. That is how, if I'm not able to implement actual change in her own life, I can at least guarantee that she will carry that knowledge across future generations. And that is how you slowly end this cycle. And that is how you slowly start to implement actual change. The part of the paradox of being a woman is that we are constantly observed as objects of desire rather than people with desire. We are simultaneously hypersexualized and demonized. So navigating that contradiction, that paradox, is extremely conflicting, it's extremely distressing, and it's extremely traumatic. So when I start to embrace my desire, when I start to embrace my nature as a sexual being, that is how you make sense. So, given all that we said, provocation is not education. When I first started as a sex educator, I wanted to do it all. I wanted to yell and scream and be angry and furious. And then I realized that if I truly want to get my message across, provoking the audience is not the way to go. And it's destined to create resistance and defense. Because for us to be able to adapt and survive in the environment we were born in, we had to accommodate ourselves to the beliefs that society imposed on us. We not only do we accommodate ourselves, we identify with these beliefs. So for example, um, what has kept me safe, has allowed me to survive, becomes a part of who I am, becomes a part of my identity. An example would be the very strong association between hyena and virginity. Virginity then means chastity, it means purity, and it means your value, your sense of worth as a woman is tied back to the high. So instead of me going straight to this point, I'm jumping the gun way too far. I have to go back to what she knows and work with where she is at and scaffold incrementally from there before I'm able to jump to this conclusion. Because if I go there right away, she will not absorb anything. I cannot attack her, her sense of identity and self-worth without uprooting where it came. Where it came. Make sense? But like I said, scaffolding information is essential, it's crucial. And I cannot impose white feminist rhetoric and Western ways of being onto an airborne because it's completely inapplicable to her context. And I paste the information based on what she needs to know, not based on what I want her to learn. So to sum up, what do we need to remember when talking about sexual health to air particular women? This is like basically our, our manifesto and uh, mother being. Number one, I have to normalize the conversation and terminology air. Number two, I have to acknowledge the lived experience and collective struggles in order to create relatability, openness, and connection. Number three, I have to meet her from where she's already at. I have to speak with her, not at her. Four, provocation and information overload will almost always be met with resistance and defensiveness, and that inhibits actual learning. And five, I have to contextualize educational content in a culturally relevant way. And I have to plant the seeds for curiosity and openness, not rebellion in existence. Any questions? Yeah. And you talked about FGM and vaginism. 
What do you think are other common uh, health issues that women have and that are not aware of in Egypt? Okay, so issues with, with their arousal, issues with desire, issues with pleasure, pain, um, the sense of fear they, they feel towards sex in general. It's terror, not fear, actually. Uh, sense of fear and disgust they feel towards their own body. Uh, sexual pain in all its causes, um, difficulty reaching orgasm, uh, difficulty becoming aroused. There's talk all day about all the issues women face in this country. Um, but they're all very interrelated, and it's not just one cause of that. So, if you have any questions, just hold them until we finish our presentations, and then but just write them down so don't forget them. I would also like to leave you with this quote before I got there are systems in this world that have everything to gain from your disembodiment. Because empty bodies are easier to use. Stay Thank you, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, hi, Alex. Uh, you're on me. Uh, have you? I'm not moving. Let me. Unmute yourself, please. Oh, there you go. Um, hello and good morning everyone i apologize i was going off screen a lot i've been uh pretty sick for the last like five days so um just be patient with me while i'm blowing my nose <laughs> um it's really good to share space with you all um i'm just going to quickly introduce myself how i would um introduce myself to folks here uh proper to my community um, so, Buju and Dinawe Makonadok, Gichiganda Gokwe, Indigenakas, Ajijak Nindudem, Gawa Baganakak, Indunjaba. So, hello everyone. My name is Alex McDougall. Um, my clan is the Crane Clan, and I come from White Earth Reservation here in Minnesota. Um, but I currently live in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I work um, as a community educator and um, outreach manager. And so we work specifically with victim survivors of domestic violence and sexual exploitation. Um, as was previously mentioned, I have been doing youth work for um, close to 10 years now, working specifically with trafficked youth um, ages five to 25. Um, and providing education resources, all of that stuff specifically within the indigenous communities here in Minnesota. Um, I do not have a presentation. I am just going to speak, um, but I really am looking forward to questions um, at the end. I love having conversations about all the things that we're talking about today. So um, mine might be a little bit quicker. As I said, I've been a little sick. So um, thank you all. So I'll just get started. So. I'm going to be talking about the differences um, in education and conversations and services that are provided around the United States currently um, and how that pertains to mental health, um, suicide, teenage pregnancies, and so on. So um, there was actually a study done, and this was a few years back um, in 2018, just about, um, and I should preface too that there is a lot of um, differences in views and opinions from parents and educators of the, around the United States, specifically around sex and sexuality, um, and how much they would like their children to be exposed to as far as these conversations go. So kind of just going back, um, Planned Parenthood is a clinic um, throughout the United States that provides different um, medical health um, services along with education. Um, again, it's they're located all throughout the United States. Um, so back in 2018, they had actually done a study that focused on the views um, and wants and opinions and outlooks from parents of school age children. Um, and what they had found um, is that within the United States, the majority of parents with school age children are in support of discussions and education surrounding the bodies of their children and how our bodies work. 
And so this kind of encompasses a whole bunch of things, um, including safer sex practices. So that would be the use of birth control, um, condoms, um, sorry, <laughs> um, birth control, condoms, all of the things that can help folks be safer if they are engaging in sexual acts, um, specifically through a more harm reductive model. And so just kind of going off of the list that folks aren't supportive are um, the way that our reproductive organs work. Um, what happens if somebody is aroused, what that looks like, what that means, um, destigmatizing those things that our bodies do that we don't necessarily have control over, um, pregnancy, sexually transmitted infections, um, and also, super importantly, um, consent, puberty, what puberty looks like for different people, um, healthy relationships, again, birth control, amongst a lot of other things um, that are really relevant here in the U.S. So the percentage of folks, parents, um, and educators who are in support of this education and conversations um, are actually at, they're pretty high um, for folks ages 12 to 14, which would be middle school age here. Um, the folks that are in support of that are actually at 93%. And again, this really does vary um, state to state and district to district. Um, and 97% of parents are in support of these conversations within high school ages. And that would be ranging from 14 to 18 years of age. And um, again, so that varies from district to district. And um, something that has been a huge conversation here um, is just the funding and the programming and the willingness to be able to provide these services and educational efforts um, for folks. So while parents um, and educators on an individual level are in support of these services and educational efforts, um, the act access to these conversations and information um, being dispersed to school-age children are varying state from state and again, district to district. Um, and so really what's happening is that the extent, and this was kind of covered before um, when with the folks that did this before me, but um, here in Minnesota, for example, there is a lot of diff different um, types of education being provided throughout the state. And it is super important that we are talking about um, sexuality and pleasure and consent and all of the things. But again, where our role is in um, deconstructing patriarchy, deconstructing colonialism that has been ultimately inflicted into and onto all of us. Um, and so in some schools and in some organizations and communities around Minnesota, these are things that are are, are being talked about, which is really great, because how are we supposed to normalize sexuality um, and sex without being able to, without looking at the broader picture of decolonizing and deconstructing patriarchy, because ultimately, um, those very deeply ingrained efforts are doing what they are supposed to be doing to our communities and to our women and to our children. Um, so back in 2018, the CDC, and that was actually 2021, um, the Center for Disease Control found that less than 50% of high schools, high schools um, provide information covering nearly 20 topics that are otherwise taught in more progressive and less conservative settings. And this includes um, a lot of things that don't even necessarily pertain to sex um, and sexuality. And of course, all of these things do apply to that, but it applies to just like the broader way that we live um, and carry ourselves and act within the duration of our lives. So um, that would be decision making. 
feeling okay with saying yes about something, saying no for the sake of saying no, um, because you want to. Maybe you don't want to go out to eat with your friends at 9 p.m. because you're already in bed watching Netflix. Um, there's a lot of different things that come with this types of these types of education. And these things ultimately aren't being taught um, or provided to folks. So Again, um, a lot of things that are missing within our education system is focused around decision making, um, consent, pleasure, transmission of STIs, pregnancy, how menstruation works, what is a period, um, what does that mean, what does a typical cycle look like for someone, um, communication, and that could be with partners, friends, family members. Um, and lastly, there is very little talk about shame and stigma around sexuality and bodies and reproductive freedom, um, which I think is something that all of our communities probably share. And so by not doing this, and um, I think too, a lot of schools in the U.S. are very straightforward in the education that is being provided as far as like there's been a big push to talk about um, sex in a way that isn't an obligation versus something that we do do for pleasure. However, there aren't a lot of talks about why people feel shame, why there is stigma, and there is still a really big push on um, sex education specifically on women, um, which I can talk about a little bit later. So, um. When we're talking about sex education, I will kind of just talk about, and this was talked about um, previously too, about culturally responsive and specific ways of going about talking about this. There are, we have a very mixed um, community of people here in Minnesota. And so when we are providing these services and education, we're ultimately missing out on a large amount of people um, because of the way that these things are delivered. And that is typically delivered through a um, culturally lens that is specific to white folks. And as we have an education system that is super, super diverse, um, for those of you that don't know, um, Minnesota is a very big relocation area for um, folks around the U.S. immigrating here, but also from outside of the U.S. And so we have truly just a very large, diverse um, group of people. And so when we are talking about sex education, again, being targeted through a white lens, um, there are lots of experiences and um, views that are being dismissed um, for a lot of other folks. So um, I'll just speak to my own community. Um, Native folks in the United States, and I'll talk about Minnesota specifically, um, Native folks, and we have folks that are um, from a lot of different communities who originally resided on this land, um, but currently are specifically within Native hubs within the Twin Cities area, which is St. Paul, Minnesota, um, and then also Minneapolis, which is our sister city here. Um, they are essentially not, we are not receiving the education that is truly beneficial to us. And a big reason to that is because of the fact that um, Native folks, specifically children, have the highest rates of sexual abuse, trauma, um, and trafficking than any other community within the state of Minnesota. Um, and so when we are talking about sex, and again, like these things are being offered in schools here, and consent, and pregnancy, um, and decision making, and communication, all of the things, but we're not talking about stigma. We're not talking about consent in the past um, versus we're talking about it as like, this is something that you can do. But when we have, you know, kids going back to their homes where they are being abused, there's a lot of different um, 
headbutting that goes on because if education and conversations um, and transparency isn't happening within the homes, what's happening at school um, and in traditional educational settings isn't necessarily doing um, the job that it's supposed to because this isn't a well-rounded um well-rounded approach coming from a lot of different people. So we can talk about one thing in schools, but then when folks go home, if there isn't that openness and willingness to talk about these things, um, it's harder to see change. And I do think that this is rooted in cultural differences. Um, and the fact that one model doesn't work for everyone is really um, important to recognize because again, we are missing out on a large group of people. Um, and so when it does come to culturally specific knowledge sharing, um, there is a lot of things missing from that. Um, again, our education system as a whole, not just with sexuality and sex education, but our education system as a whole is really aimed and targeted at um, white communities. And that is all across the board. We have a big issue here with um, transparency um, in the ways that colonialism and patriarchy have ultimately been inflicted on a lot of communities here. And, and that's a newer, that's a newer thing. And so um, that was just something that I wanted to touch on. I think when we do talk about culturally specific services, specifically for, um, you know, Indigenous communities, there is a lack of, and I think, too, this would be super helpful for all communities, um, but the the way that we talk about sexuality and sex um, really should come from an emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical wellness model um, and how ultimately sex and sexuality affects all of these things, just like emotional well-being affects sex, mental well-being affects sex and sexuality and spiritual as well. Um, and so all of these things ultimately contribute and have this relationship with each other that isn't being recognized. Um, and I know that that was talked about previously, but it really is so important that when um, we are talking about these things that we're fitting in all of those different aspects of ourselves to create a healthy, holistic way um, of talking about this. Um, so, being that um, folks are not always able to have access to these conversations within the home, we do need to push for change um, within the education system. So something that is really important to recognize is that a lot of Southern states here in the United States are the states that are not providing comprehensive, holistic um education when it comes to sex and sexuality. On the other hand, um, what we see a lot of, and I, I don't know if this is true to, to you all as well, but that states that are not providing comprehensive sex education with the goal of, um, or with the mindset that by not providing this, we are promoting abstinence really is not true. Um, by not talking about it, we are setting young people up for um, potential lifelong consequences that ultimately is at no fault of their own. And so uh, Southern states here, again, have less education, um, less transparent education, um, and focuses more on the relationship between marriage and sex and sexuality. Those communities are ultimately seeing higher rates of teen pregnancies, higher rates of um, STIs, um, and also higher rates of suicide. So when we're talking about stigma, when we're talking about um, patriarchy and all of these things, we are essentially within the United States promoting um, 
negative things by not talking transparently about about the things that we all experience, no matter what the level that is. And so what's happening within our system is that we're rooting um, sex and sexuality into religion, cultural customs. Again, that can be helpful, though. Um, the relationships between sex and marriage, healthy relationships, and how relationships are being modeled within the home. Um, and that goes with gender roles as well. And so again, it is really hard when we are taught from a very young age that we are to act a certain way, that sex is um, belonging to a specific life points such as marriage um we're ultimately causing harm on our young people and causing further harm um on the communities that we belong to so when we talk about agency um why I like to think about it is that we are setting folks up to be their best selves and I think that this does start and is rooted um in talking about these things at a really young age. I mean, we even, a big example that I like to bring up a lot is, um, you know, young kids, we have this expectation that because they're young that we can't learn from them and vice versa. Um, and I think a lot about like how we as adults um, are very like, oh my gosh, there's, you know, my niece is here and oh, I just wanna hug and give kisses and do all those things. From a really young age, we're not promoting consent because we think that we are owed something. Um, and so talking about agency, promoting these things from a young age that, hey, do you want to give me a hug? Can I have a hug? These types of things are really important. Um, and they're all things that we can do. However, I have a you know complete understanding of the larger systemic issues um, that do belong and are rooted in a lot of our communities. Um, so again, like agency, um, to me is that individuals are able to make the choices that they want. They are able to be focused on the relationship that they have with themselves first and foremost. Um, women and other folks are saying yes, because it's something that they want to do. And women are saying no, because that's something that they do not want to do and honoring that and feeling comfortable in that. Um, that choice and the relationship with themselves ultimately needs to come first. The knowledge of autonomy is important because we're able to learn and grow and acknowledge ourselves and what we do or do not want for ourselves. And again, just being able to honor that. That doesn't mean that we are being selfish or that this pertains just to sex and sexuality. Rather, it means that we are making ourselves the best that we can, honoring our wants and needs. Um, and that we're ultimately creating space for a better well-being for ourselves and ourselves as women, um, but also for other women and the generations that come after us. Um, and so with that, um, that is all that I have for today. I really appreciate everybody's patience. Um, today is my first day working in a few days. And so um, I thank you all. And I am looking forward to the question um, portion of this. And I hope that I'll have more to offer during that time. Thank you so much, Alex. First of all, thank you so much for being with us when you're sick, um, waking up so early. We really do appreciate it. And I love your talk, definitely. And I, I certainly have questions. Uh, I just want to give the floor to Wendy before we go to questions because the time is kind of limited. But uh, please, everyone, if you have questions, write them down for all three speakers. I have mine down already. Uh, thank you very much again, Alex. Thank you so much. Uh, Wendy, you're up. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And, uh, you know, I'm following, uh, it, it's two hard acts to follow that uh, a lot has been said already. So I will try to um, offer something uh, different that maybe hasn't been said already. Um, I primarily work with um, uh, women and girls who have experienced sexual, sexual um, uh, abuse uh, or um, domestic violence or have been trafficked and the the underlying the so the underpinning of um, what I see is the biggest issue right now is that there continues to be a war on women 
Women are still commodified. Women are still used as tools of war, for example. And it's in the empowerment of women that we are going to be able to change that. The empowerment of girls and the education of boys so that we can talk about sex in a healthy way, that it does not, it's not used as a power, as a tool of power, uh, that is, that it is healthy, that it is um, consensual, that it is a, ch a, a choice, that it is not something to be <clears throat> feared, that everybody has a choice. But what we're seeing um, in Canada, and I and I think similarly in in the U.S., is uh, very much a rise of the the right uh, thinking, and along with that comes uh, the the will to control and dominate over power over um, women. Uh, we are the life givers. We are, you know, we are extremely important to the existence of humanity, and so when. Um, when power and control become issues, uh, we are the first victims. And this has been over, over centuries. And so if we don't begin to address the patriarchy, if we don't begin to address the oppression of women and girls, uh, children, we really, um, as a society, I, I think that that is the, what we need to turn our minds to. And we, we do need to be able to educate our kids in a way that is comfortable. I remember with my own sex education uh, in school, it was very biological and the boys and the girls were separated. Uh, and, um, you know, we learned the biology, we learned the parts of our bodies, the correct names for the parts of our bodies and how to make a baby. And that's about it. Uh, nobody talked about sex. When when my mother, uh, when I was reaching puberty, when my mother talked to me, she said, if a boy pushes you against a wall, you should say no. So I waited and waited for some boy to push me against a wall and that never happened. You know, that was not, uh, she didn't know how to talk about it because her mother didn't know how to talk about it. So the more that we are able to be comfortable and normalize sexuality instead of abnormalizing it, as has already been said, uh, that we really need to be able to have these conversations in safe spaces. And, um, you know, Al Alex said a really uh, important thing about Indigenous uh, women and girls. And, and unfortunately, our statistics are the same in Canada in terms of trafficking. Um, Indigenous people make up about 5% of the entire Canadian population, um, but they represent over 51% of the girls and women who are trafficked. So there's a dehumanization. There is a, uh, and we, and again, we see this in war. We see the power and control. And um, could I share my screen for a second, Yasmin? Do I yeah. have the ability to do that? If you want, we should. Yep, I got it. So I just want to show you this. This is often, this is something that we use in, let me see if I can do it for there for now. This is a tool that we use in the, the work that we do to be able to help um, women and girls identify um, what the tactics of abuse that are happening uh, in their lives are. And sexual abuse is one part of it. Um, we certainly work with a, a, a lot of newcomer uh, women um, and who have different experiences uh, with sex, who, who think it's... Um, you know, that, that it's, uh, um, they must have sex with their husband whenever he asks for it, uh, that, that um, they have no choice, they have no autonomy, they have no agency. So those are the attitudes and values that we need to be changing. Um, so we show this one, and then we also, I don't know if I have the other one. Yes, I do. So then we show the equality wheel. Um, <clears throat> where we look at what a, a relationship without violence would would be. And these these wheels were developed by women who have experienced some kind of abuse in their life. Um, so we we compare and contrast. And I think that's really important in terms of the education. Empowerment, you know, I believe in you, I see you, I hear you, I believe you, um, is really uh, goes a long way when working with uh, women who have experienced some kind of abuse so that they can begin to take back um, their autonomy and some choice in their life. And um, so sex as a, as a tool for power and control 
um, is still a huge issue. And, um, you know, we've seen in our own education system in, in Canada, uh, parents pushing back, they don't want to, they don't want teachers talking about sex in schools, you know, they're going to do it in their own homes. And, and um, it, you, whether whatever side of the debate you fall on, it's uh, important to know that those conversations may not happen in those homes, you know, and so then we're raising a whole other generation of kids who um, <clears throat> have been exposed to uh, different forms of education. And the most prevalent form of education right now is pornography. And I think it's really important that we talk about that because access to pornography uh, is is uh, is so easy. A five year old with a, a cell phone can have access to pornography, where they're learning about power and control and uh, what what appears to be normal, healthy, consensual sex through porn. And you know, ninety nine point nine percent of it, in my opinion, is not that. It is it is violence against women, and. Um, so we have to understand that we're we're fighting a very uphill battle. We have the rise of the right. We have um, we have pornography, and we have education systems that are not willing to uh, really talk to kids about what they need to talk about. That's a generalization because there's obviously awesome teachers out there, um, <clears throat> but I think those are the the issues that I would like to add to this conversation. Um, I, I am conscious of the time, so um, maybe I'll, I'll stop there and because and, I'd love to hear everybody's questions. Thank you for that, Wendy, as usual. Thank you so much. The, the wheel is really so informative, as usual. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, questions? Before I begin my own questions, any questions to all three speakers? Can I say something really quick? <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, sorry. I thought someone was asking a question. Um, I do want to go back, and this was something that I had forgotten to mention when I was speaking. But Wendy, thank you so much about the role of um talking about the role um that men and boys have. Um, I think that there's so much push on women to get educated and have the access to education about sex and sexuality. Um, but as we're talking about patriarchy and colonialism and all of the things, there is also a very specific responsibility that goes on to men and boys um, when we are talking about um, relationships, communication, consent, sex, and all of the things. Um, and a lot of change starts there as well. And that's not to say that women shouldn't have access to this and um, everything that comes with that, but both need to be educated on power and control. What this looks like, consent, the role that men and boys have historically had in the harm against women is really important. That's very true. And I do agree with that, definitely. I actually have a part of my course talks about the role of male feminism and a big part of that is well to for change to happen we have to have men on board and boys on board to actually help the case or else we just talk to ourselves we need them in our community to actually be educated about the same thing as well that's very true okay um questions for us i have a set of questions of my own uh okay, questions let me know now okay all right well i have a question for all three speakers uh, how do you deal with the resistant parents or the resistant uh, parties that are, you, no matter how understanding you try to be, no matter how professional you try to be, in the same information given on that topic, which is very sensitive, especially amongst certain cultures and communities, how do you deal with the resistance trying to convey that it's for their own benefit? It's not like the opposite. Um, uh, uh, Malek and Alex and then Wendy, can you can we answer that uh, first? Great. Um, so I begin by asking or trying to find common ground we have. All right. So whenever I encounter resistance from, let's say, parents, women, or men, I try to find what can we actually agree on. So usually the resistance always stems from a place of fear. And it stems from a place of fearing what you don't know, which is a very normal human emotion. What you don't know, you will naturally fear or reject. So I try to tiptoe around that fear by first removing the intimidation you feel towards information. And that's when you start having a conversation. But I cannot 
counter that, that resistance with more information over. I have to meet the person where they are first, and then I build up. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Alex, would you be able to answer that? Uh, I I have definitely been in these situations before, and I would I would say that I try my hardest because it could be frustrating um, to approach these conversations and situations with curiosity, um, and also providing folks if they are receptive to it um, and agree to it finding those commonalities where we can agree on things and also be making sure that folks um, specifically in this context, parents have access to the same education that their children will have um, so that they feel competent too, because it is intimidating, especially when we're talking about just generational differences. Um, it can be intimidating and scary to like have your 10 year old knowing more than you know about X, Y, and Z things. Um, also taking into consideration just that more people um, often than not have had experiences with sexual abuse and have sexual trauma. And so making sure that we are able to talk with them where they are at, like was just said, I think is really an important and approaching situations and conversations with curiosity, I think is bottom line. Um, what should happen? Uh, Wendy? I completely agree with everything that's been said. I would just add that uh, at our agency, for example, we're a small agency, <laughs> but we, <clears throat> it's important for us to have diversity in our uh, work place um so for example we um one of the counselors is uh from sudan she's arabic um speaking and um she is very open about the fact that she's experienced um female genital mutilation and so uh it makes it easier for her to have to start that conversation where a woman uh coming from a similar life experience um was and i think that's really important it's uh, I completely agree. We need to start wherever the woman is. Um, but sometimes we're, we're just, you know, it's hard for us to, to get our heads around their experience versus ours. So the diversity is really important to have in a workplace as well and in, in a teaching uh, situation. Uh, mind you, is something that, um, that happens in the U.S. and Canada still doesn't happen here. We don't have that kind of education actually incorporated in, the, in our regular mainstream education, whether it's uh, national or international education, and we just don't have that. It's just not in the culture yet, and it's just it's not in the system yet. So uh, the only channels in Egypt that we have we social media channels, especially Mother Being being one of the two platforms that could offer that kind of education. Um, in the U.S. and Canada, what would you say would be the the best way to approach this? The best, the most effective channels. Would it would be the educated channels or the social media channels? Which kind of cha which channels are most beneficiary in your points of view? Um, well, I'm I'm pretty old school, so it's it, but I do think that social media is a really great way to to reach young people. Uh, you have to you have to you have to be on top of the technology. You know, I I have clients who only will text me, for example. And so you have to be able to reach them where they are. I think we should be mm -hmm. in schools. Uh, you know, we should be in classrooms. We should be offering uh, education about what human trafficking is, for example. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's not something that is regularly talked about and certainly never talked about um, throughout my entire education in social work. We never even, it was never talked about but it was happening for sure mm -hmm. so i think we need to just get real and and get in get in classrooms and where kids are uh, oh, sorry what was that I'd like to add anything alex yeah yeah, I would say, again, what you said, Wendy, I think um, social media has taken over the world. And I think that um, that is a great way to get stuff across. I would say the only thing where I am definitely like, pro 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 having this in school-based settings is that when we are talking with young kids about this it doesn't need to be hey this is what sex is this is what sex looks like but we can start having those conversations about what healthy relationships look like what boundaries look like all of those things because that does tie into um sex and sexuality um and so i am very much so i think it should be in both settings um but social media is super effective. The only thing I can see um, 
issue with that is folks might not be comfortable having conversations. And I think a lot can be had um, through conversations, whereas that might not always be available to have on a social media within a social media space. I, I agree. I think both are important. Absolutely. Um, okay. I completely agree with both points. My only issue with social media is that you get an overload of information and you get like bite-sized information that tends to be very limited. And so for someone who already has a limited background when it comes to the different information and access, it's very hard to contextualize the, the information you're receiving. So I agree that we need more conversational spaces where these kinds of educational uh, uh, discussions can be held in safe spaces rather than just like receiving chunks of information online. Well, here we also have a problem with accessibility to information because, well, it's not in school, so the only way you can access information is through having smartphones, internet connection, and actually knowing these platforms, which are not many in Egypt. Uh, what do you do about women who need to be informed, but there's no way to reach them via your platform? Is there anything you can like, do? You go on the ground, do you, do you work so, with people? So, um, yeah, we conduct workshops with NGOs, okay, specifically ones that work with the uh, refugee groups yes. um we've done those a lot but we still have very limited access to rural egypt upper egypt and these kinds of areas mm -hmm. uh, because you need specialized organizations to go on the ground uh, and that tends to have to go through the government permits and that's important <laughs> that's another level. Totally. <laughs> all right any other questions because i also have other questions for uh alex and wendy yeah no. okay we have one question raise your voice yeah yeah I don't know if it's a controversial one, but uh, first, oh, this question's for Malak. For Malak, okay. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was curiosity. And I was wondering with the rise of discussion about uh, like same sex relationships, mm -hmm. do you think that is equally important to mention that within the realms of curiosity and sex? So that's part of what it means to contextualize information you get. I cannot be in a room of women that would have a hard time embracing their own sexuality and their own body parts and then shove onto them information about LGBTQ. That is too far off from where their mind is at. And I need to incrementally give information in a way that they can actually apply to their life in a way that's relevant to them instead of shoving down my own ideology what i believe needs to be imposed onto them i have to apply to their needs first and not what i would like them to learn yeah so, i mean there's also the, the the security issue that comes up. oh yeah <laughs> that's why i thought it's really controversial yes. <laughs> i think it's also we're in a country where fgm is is, is an alarming rate this yeah. is it's got so many other consequences yeah. it's really yeah. serious uh and it, it goes from generation to generation unless it stops, even though it's incriminated in every single part of the law. Yeah. It's even against a lot to actually uh critical propaganda for it. Yeah. But then uh it's there's another dynamic of why it happens. So to address these issues. Um, I mean I mean my only my only concern was that we do address FGM a lot, but within again our space, we yes. only address it towards Yes. other Egyptians in different communities. There are so some why NGOs. There are some NGOs that do that. There yeah, are I just feel like we talk about it a lot and we've, you know, we've heard so much about FGM, but then we don't like talk about The it. issue with FGM is that it is um, tied to religious beliefs, yeah, yeah. And, which is a huge misconception. And you have to be able to understand that it cuts through class and it cuts through geography. It's very common to answer that and Africa in general. Um, so you have to prioritize what you want to address first, rather than trying to do everything all at once. And yeah. there are on ground initiatives that happen a lot in these in areas where it's very prevalent. Um, and people do have access to social media nowadays. And there are there are so many women who you know you wouldn't think have undergone this who actually have. Okay, my last sorry, my last sure, last sure. If there was one thing that you'd speak up about uh, regarding sex. In AUC, though, not, not, we're not talking about like the general population. I might surprise you. Actually. Only AUC. Actually, we had a workshop with AUC last year uh, with Haya. And funnily enough, during that workshop with AUC students, 
most people to, in the audience didn't know what an erection was. So you might think that a lack of sex ed is something that, that depends on class and education, but it cuts through, I mean, it's a generalized issue, it's, it's a generalized gap. And I cannot assume that, that just because someone's from AUC and educated in that they know more than someone. The workshop I've given to refugee Syrian women, they were much more informed about their bodies and sexuality than the AUC students I taught class. It'd be also uh, surprising, yeah. the boys, yes. how much the boys know about women's bodies and what, what they should know and what, what, our, what consent is, what our rights are. This is a different story. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Is uh, Is that something about um, social media? It's for anyone else. Okay. Uh, I'll be <laughs> speaking. Okay. Uh, social media, it's like the only platform that people are using to give sex and in uh, Arab countries. Is there any way, we also mentioned this one of our sessions, is there any way that we can normalize sex ed, like educational systems in Arab countries? That's a uh, hoop uh, of things <laughs> out, out of our scope completely, unfortunately. Um, it's out of our scope, right? It's out of our scope. We'd love to, but then uh, there are, again, cultural considerations, religious considerations, security considerations. It's, it's uh, so many scopes all together, mm -hmm. and it won't be, it's, it's well, maybe one day, but uh, what, we, what we can work with right now is things that are, we have accessibility with to handle that. Otherwise, we'd love to have this normalized one day in another context that agrees with us. In our culture, yeah. it's still very, very strong belief that we teach about sex to promote top students. Um, I don't see it moving to state anytime soon. Um, for several reasons I cannot get into right now. But I do see a change in the collective mindset towards sex ed, uh, especially in online spaces. I cannot speak for governmental policies, but in online spaces, there is a small change in frame. The resistance, I think, is a little less. The aggression, I think, towards mother being yes, is a little less. It's more accepting right yes. now. And you can ask about the male uh, um, responses or reaction, or is it increasing right now? Um, there is a huge resistance coming from men. Okay. Oh, resistance from men. We okay. come to learning about sex from women. Interesting. Okay. Um, we would love to create content and programs for men, but we also we always we we always face the hurdle of no man will want to learn about sex from a woman. Uh, no Egyptian typical man will want to learn about sex from. Uh, even though they do send us questions anonymously and like anonymously. Anonymously. and it, it does happen, but there's still this hurdle of how can I incentivize a man to listen to a woman speak about sex? Oddly, and actually speaking about her body, her autonomy, autonomy. Yeah. her peace, yeah. that's the thing. Because sex is the thing that tends to be perceived as belonging to the man. So when a man can overstep his ego and feel like I can learn more from a woman, that takes a lot of inner work. All right, uh, Wendy and Alex, do you have that same concern in the US and Canada? The resistance from men to actually listen to women talk about their needs and what autonomy is? Oh, yes. Um, you know, it, a perfect example is, you know, the, the, the uh, the ongoing fight about abortion rights, whether you whether you agree with those or not, you know it's still something that always gets challenged. And it, again, it's a, in my opinion a power and control issue. Yeah, I I agree. I would say um, I'm sure every one of us have been in a situation where somebody addresses something they have an issue with, and then that is addressed in a way that is educational, um, and they know that you're right. <laughs> And then another issue gets brought up and then you come back with it and they know that you're right. And then it just keeps snowballing. Um, I would say that that is the experience here in the U.S. that um, folks know that they are in the wrong, but they continue to bring up new issues um, that aren't even relevant to what was originally being talked about. Um, and so there's a lot of avoidance. Um, with that. And I would say, I don't, I obviously don't know anybody's names who's in the class, but somebody had said something about educational efforts um, within the school settings. I would say that issues like this um, around sexuality and honestly, just anything that can be seen as, um, oh my gosh, I can't think of the word, um, 
something that shouldn't be talked about really is um, our grassroots efforts. And it should be approached as such, because when we can plant little seeds, um, even if it's just with one person, that will make a change in the future. Um, and that also gives people the curiosity to do their own research and have their own relationship with sex and sexuality. Um, when we provide on an individual level, openness and understanding and curiosity and are welcoming to questions um, about this stuff, so. Thank you very much, Austin. Okay, to sum it up, uh, I just need to, in each of you in, in one or two minutes, just to tell me the effects of the impact of uh, when women know about their bodies, body autonomy, uh, culture, when they actually get to learn about their bodies within their, their own realms of culture, how does that impact their decisions in their, their lives? How does that impact them? Well, you make your decisions from a place of shame, of guilt, and lack of information. That looks a certain way, versus when you make your decisions and make your choices from a place that comes from curiosity, factual evidence, and reality, that looks completely different. I'm not trying to impose a particular world, worldview or ideology or particular choices of what you should be doing with your body. I'm giving you the information you need to make you question the, the script you've been taught to follow. That to me is what it taught me. It's me having the information I need to forge my own path. Even if I don't have the agency to do it, I will make different choices for my own daughter moving forward. All right, uh, Alex and Wendy. Alex, wanna go ahead? Yeah, sure, I can go. Um, I have um, nothing really different to say, um, except that when we do have an understanding of like our own autonomy, we have um, free will to make our own choices, whatever it may be, we're improving so many things. We're improving our overall holistic well-being. We are improving our mental health. We are improving the lives for folks that are around us um, because we're role models and we are, no matter how hard it may be, um, taking control of our own space and our own life and our choices. Um, and that ultimately and I, I know I said this before, but a lot of things do start in the home. And that may be from a privileged mindset. I don't know. Um, but that if we can have these conversations and we can show what this looks like and how it is so um, crucial to everything, every aspect of our life, um, we're just being good role models. That might sound simple, but um, that's what I got. <laughs> Alex? Andy? Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, what I would say, and I hope this doesn't sound too um, uh, strong, but the empowerment of women and girls is fundamental to the survival of humanity. And when we empower women and girls, when we uh, embrace uh, the collective energy that divine feminine, I call it. I'm not a religious person, but I that's the energy of the, you know, that I think we all carry within us, whether we're male or female. Um, but that energy is going to help us to to bring the world together in a better way. And and it's the isolation and the 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 mansplaining, frankly, and the and the um uh you know, the use of uh tactics like um gaslighting that are keeping uh, women and girls separated from themselves and from their communities. And so I think the empowerment of women and girls is where we need to focus our energy. Thank you so much. Really, today was wonderful. Thank you so much. Very informative. It's a big round of applause for all these speakers. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I really cannot thank you both enough, especially for waking up that early uh, in Ontario and in Minnesota. I and it's a Sunday, so today off for you both. Really, thank you so much. I do appreciate it. And Alex, hope you get well soon. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you guys next semester, definitely. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Awesome. You thank all. you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks. I'm going to hang up.